small definitive from Nepal, we'll start the journey for this episode. This stamp features Nepal's emblem or coat of arms back when it was issued in 1996 and it is filled with a lot of symbolic imagery of Nepal, something that we'll have to take a much closer look at as we explore this stamp. Nepal is written in both English and Nepali at the top, but only in white Nepali text are the words postage stamp at the bottom and Nishana Chop on the left, national emblem, labeling the image on the stamp. Oh, and thanks to some members from the online philatelic community on Twitter for helping me out. The value is 25 pesa of the Nepalese rupee, and it is a used stamp, with just faint evidence of ink postmarks in both bottom corners. The stamp is carmine in color, and it measures 20 and a half by 26 millimeters. I have found some really interesting covers from Nepal that I'm looking forward to exploring, as well as a Himalayan expedition cover, which is really cool. I also have some interesting stamps from Nepal as well, but again, I don't know much about the country of the stamp that I pulled out of the box, in this case, Nepal. Well, I do know that Nepal has the mountains of the Himalayas, eight of the 10 tallest mountains with the tallest of them all Everest that they share with China. I know they have a really cool flag and the triangles of the flag are said to symbolize their mountains. Oh, and veering into topics that I collect, they play cricket. It's their second most popular sport after soccer and their national cricket team is the Rhinos. Which brings me to one other thing that I know is that Nepal has rhinos. It's of course the great one horn rhino, also known as the Indian rhino. And they also have lots of temples. Hinduism is the dominant religion, but Buddhism and Islam have a strong presence as well. Yep, that's, that's it. That's everything that I know about Nepal right now. Nepal is here. It's a landlocked country in Asia consisting of the Himalayan mountain range, and it's bordering India and China. Its capital city is Kathmandu, and it's a country that has never formally been colonized. Although its history and politics are very much entangled with those of South Asia, and philatelically, the postal history seems to often be studied and collected as part of the larger Himalayan region, meaning that the Tibetan region of China, Nepal, Bhutan, and Sikkim, a Northeast Indian state, are all part of a fascinating look at Himalayan philately. For instance, there is literature out there dedicated to Himalayan philately, and there's an active Nepal and Tibet philatelic study circle, which on their website also mentions that they study Sikkim and Bhutan. I'll leave the link to their website in the video description. Okay, so we're gonna to stick to just Nepal for this episode, and let's get started with looking at the stamp that we pulled from the box. Let's take a closer look at the imagery and see what it can teach us about Nepal. As already mentioned, this national emblem is on a 1996 postage stamp. And I mention the year because it is already outdated. This particular emblem was used from 1962 until 2008 when Nepal's monarchy was abolished, it was replaced with this one, which got a minor update in 2020. So we're looking at an older emblem on the stamp, when Nepal still had a king. And there's a lot of imagery here which may give us some quick facts about the country of Nepal. Firstly, there are two branches with flowers. These are Nepal's national flowers, the rhododendron. Beautiful flowers that are indigenous to the high Himalayas and a welcome sign of spring actually have a Nepal stamp from 1962 that features these exact flowers. They're beautiful, especially with the contrast of snow-capped peaks in the background. And those Himalayas are in the background of this emblem, along with the Green River Valley in the foreground. This is supposed to be the River Gandak, a major river in Nepal and a tributary of the Ganges. There is a white cow to the left of the river, or a type of cattle known as zebu, Today the cow is a national animal of Nepal and it's a sacred animal of the Hindus. I have one on a stamp, here we go. I think it's the same kind of cattle, uh, just not white and facing the wrong way, but check out this Himalayan pheasant on a stamp, the national bird of Nepal. This stamp I find quite attractive with the Himalayas again in the background and this pheasant is on the emblem across from the cow on the right riverbank. 
There is a pagoda-like temple and a tree here. I've already shown you that I have several stamps featuring temples uh, from Nepal. And while I can't find a lot of information about this emblem online, I'm going to take a bit of a guess here. This tree looks pretty similar to another tree that I have on a Nepalese stamp, a Bodhi fig tree, a part of Buddhist history as Siddhartha Gautama, Buddha, was born in Nepal, but found enlightenment under a Bodhi tree in present-day India. That might be it. I don't know. Let me know if I'm right or wrong. Now, there's also a sun and a crescent moon that is on this emblem. They both have faces. These were also on the flag until 1962. Today, they remain on the flag just without the faces. And the key explanation that I found out there is that they represent the hope that Nepal will live as long as the sun and moon last. But there are multiple interpretations to this and there seems to be no one particular answer. There is a lot of other items on this emblem. Here are two flags along with the two crossing kukris, traditional machetes that have a long history with Nepal and the Gurkha soldiers. I have some stamps with knives on them, but here we go. It's a pretty handy tool and weapon that has been used for quite some time in Nepal and is today a national symbol. Okay, back to the emblem. Above it is a pair of feet. Really, I think it's the footprints of Goraknath, a Hindu yogi from the 11th century, and his footprints were left in a cave in Nepal that is a sacred Hindu site to visit. And no, I do not have any stamps with feet or footprints on them, unfortunately. Continuing above that is a royal Nepalese crown known as the Shripek, decked with precious stones. I have one on a stamp featuring King Mahendra wearing Nepal's royal crown. Quite an impressive headdress. And this stamp was issued in the 1960s. There are also two soldiers on either side. Apparently, according to one website, one is a huntsman and the other a man of the guard with a rifle, but they could also be Gurkhas, the famous Nepalese soldiers known for their courage and loyalty to Gurkhas from different times. And finally, at the very bottom is Sanskrit text that reads, the mother and the motherland are greater than heaven. A quote from the Hindu deity Rama. Like I said, let me know what I got wrong there, but as you can see, Nepal has placed imagery that is important to it on its postage stamps. These are just some of them that had similar subjects to the coat of arms that we looked at now. And the other stamps that I have include personalities and historical figures that have had an influential role in Nepal's history, along with stamps celebrating and commemorating special events, and I also have stamps that are communicating important messages. So what were the first postage stamps issued by Nepal? Well, they were issued in April of 1881 in three denominations, one anna, two annas, and four annas. They featured a simple and elegant design that included crossed kukris, you know, those curved knives we just spoke about, along with a royal feathered crown above. This design was in use from 1881 until 1930. The one that I have here is not an 1881 stamp, but a blue one and a stamp that I believe was part of a later printing. You see, these stamps were relief printed where the ink lies on the raised portions of the plate. And as the same design and plates were continuously used, the plates began to wear out. It actually didn't take very long before the lines within the design began to blend. And eventually the definition of those lines just became, well, a blurred ink blob. So this is my blurred ink blob from Nepal. Reading more about these stamps, they varied with different types of paper, some using great quality European paper, then some using paper made from the bark of evergreens. I found a great resource online that helped me to identify my stamp, and I think it is from the early 1900s, because the first printings would have extremely crisp lines, and you'd be able to easily identify the imagery or make out the imagery of the kukris and the crown. And I actually realized something when I held my stamp up to the computer screen to try and compare the stamps. And that is that I don't even know which way is up. It's so bad that it really is just an ink blob. And so you could have a lot of fun trying to catalog these stamps. There were other designs in use. 1899 saw the introduction of the one half Anna 
and by 1930 a new special design made an appearance, featuring the god Shiva Mahadeva with a trident in the Himalayas. These are very popular stamps for collectors that again had many prints, denominations and variants. Shiva is one of the principal deities of Hinduism, uh, the great god that actually lives in a mountain, uh, Mount Kailash, which is not in Nepal, but on the other side of the border in Tibet. Mountains, of course, become a common feature in Nepalese stamps, oftentimes being the focal point, the key imagery, while other times just being the backdrop, a constant presence in illustrations and photographs. Now, a couple of important things to know about Nepal as they had an impact on Nepal's postage stamps. Firstly, and as I've already mentioned, Nepal had a monarchy. It was a kingdom for 240 years since it was first formed in 1768. It also had a hereditary prime minister, so another ruling family which really had control of the politics from the 1840s all the way through the 1950s. And the monarchy went between an absolute monarchy and a constitutional monarchy and back again. Anyway, it's very complex, but it's also dramatic because there was a royal massacre in 2001. Good evening. The Himalayan Kingdom of Nepal has begun 13 days of mourning after eight members of the royal family, including the king and queen, were killed in a palace massacre last night. The killer was said to be the crown prince, who also took his own life after killing eight family members. No thorough investigation was done to really prove what happened, so it's super controversial, but the uncle of the prince, or the king's brother, suddenly was next in line to be crowned king of Nepal. I don't actually have a stamp of this king, but I'll overlay one on the desk so that you can see it. This one was issued in 2003. So this king, King Gyanendra, was king shortly after that massacre in 2001, all the way until 2008. There was civil war during this time, a lot of turmoil, but ultimately the monarch came to an end in 2008 as Nepal became a federal democratic republic. Now, I bring this up because that emblem that we were just looking at actually was replaced in 2008 with one that no longer had the coat of arms with a crown, but rather it embraced some of the national symbols and included shaking hands and the map of Nepal. And with that said, you'll no longer see the monarch on stamps. The monarch was actually no longer appearing on stamps even prior to the monarch coming to an end in 2008. The other big thing about Nepal that I found interesting is that while it had an important relationship with Britain and the British Raj through the mid 20th century, it really was a nation in isolation from the outside world. So tourism was almost non-existent because the country was closed to foreigners. And this stands out in its postal history. For example, Nepal was not part of the Universal Postal Union, a union of member countries that was established in 1874 to coordinate how international mail would flow. Ultimately, countries that are part of the UPU or the Universal Postal Union would accept each other's stamps on letters and would allow their post to travel through or even have to deliver the actual mail to a recipient. So my USA stamps are valid when I'm sending mail to Australia. OzPost will accept it and deliver it to the recipient. And the same is true when somebody mails me something from Australia, the USPS will accept the Australian stamps. Both are members of the UPU. Well, since Nepal was not part of this membership, this union, their stamps were not accepted internationally, and so international covers from Nepal are not as common as other countries prior to 1950. There was, however, a British Indian post office in the capital city of Kathmandu, and this was primarily used to send mail to India, and thus internationally. Nepal and India eventually had a postal agreement in 1936 to recognize each other's postage stamps so that mail could travel to and from any destination between the two countries. Well, India became independent in 1947, and this post office in Kathmandu became part of the Indian Embassy. And so mail leaving Kathmandu going internationally would really go through the Indian postal system using Indian stamps. You can imagine how complicated things would start to get, because if you're mailing something to Kathmandu, you would be mailing it to the embassy who would have to hand it off to the Nepalese postal service. But if you're mailing it somewhere outside of Kathmandu, somewhere else in Nepal, you would have to mail it in inside a cover that was addressed to the Indian Embassy and that item that's inside the cover would need to include Nepalese stamps so that when they hand it off to the Nepalese Postal Service they will then see that it has been paid for to travel the rest of its journey. Wow! 
When sending a letter internationally from Nepal, you could purchase Indian stamps from the Nepalese Postal Administration. They used to buy Indian stamps in bulk and sell them to the public for use on all letters meant for destinations outside Nepal. These would then be given to the Indian postal system and yeah, it's it's quite a bit complicated. There were various ways in which the mail was handled, uh, but I enjoyed reading about it in this book titled Nepal Postal History by Wolfgang Hauregel. I've actually checked this book out of the American Philatelic Research Library because I was really interested to learn more about how Nepal handled its mail prior to being part of the UPU. And this book has provided a lot of insight. If you want to learn more about it or make sense of what I was trying to say, definitely check this book out, details in the video description. Now, this confusing situation all comes to an end in the 1950s after the Nepalese revolution. Nepal was on a path to democracy, and so it was loosening its policies on isolation, and by 1956 had joined the Universal Postal Union. Therefore, it began accepting stamps from the international members, as well as its stamps were starting to be accepted around the world. And so Nepal had an international postal service. This 2006 stamp from Nepal is celebrating the 50th anniversary of being part of the Universal Postal Union. You can see it on the certificate alongside this envelope, 50th anniversary of Nepal's membership in UPU, 1956 to 2006. So I do have two covers to explore, one sent before Nepal became a member of the UPU and one sent some time afterwards, so let's check them out. This larger cover was sent from Kathmandu, Nepal to Houston, Texas in 1956. It was registered mail from the Indian Embassy in Nepal. And because it is prior to the Universal Postal Union membership, it required Indian stamps to make the international journey. We can see a total of 10 Indian Annas being used on this registered cover. This 1949 Kandari Mahadevad temple and the two Annas Lady Ancharka stamp from the five-year plan definitives first issued in 1955. These two stamps are cancelled by the Indian Embassy of Nepal on the 13th of February 1956 and then went through US Customs just six weeks later in New York on March 28th. Turning the cover over, we can see it reached Houston on the 31st of March and then the destination post office after the Sunday on April 2nd. A total journey that took 49 days and made possible by the Indian Postal Service with its post office in Kathmandu's Indian Embassy. And then just to add to this, because I easily found one, I have this cover that was sent to the Republic of Korea or South Korea back in 1969 from Kathmandu. This is of course 13 years after becoming a full member of the Universal Postal Union. Again, it is a registered letter and I love the variety of Nepalese stamps used on the cover all issued in the 1960s, one being this ML stamp with some great imagery. I believe on the right here is the demigod Garuda, king of the birds above the Himalayas. And on the left is the Nepal Airlines logo, wings with the deity Akash Barab, the Hindu god of the sky. There are stamps celebrating National Children's Day, an author, religious occasions, International Cooperation Year of 1965, and then on the back, as we turn it over, we can see an additional two stamps one celebrating the 48th birthday of King Mahendra. The postmarks are difficult to read here, but it looks like it was sent from Kathmandu on the 14th of October and then arrived in Seoul on the 21st of October 1969, a journey that only took a full week. Both of these covers have letters that are still in them. And I'm not going to read the letters out loud, but there is something interesting or something that you'll find interesting about them. They were both written by stamp collectors, different stamp collectors, and going to stamp collectors abroad, discussing stamps and requesting swaps. Which makes sense as to why these covers were looked after and kept all this time. So not only are stamp collectors and philatelists preservers or custodians of historical artifacts, Many times they're actually creators of these historical items that we can later study. Here are stamp collectors sending letters that I'm able to explore 60 and 70 years later. Today, Nepal issues stamps with a variety of topics, prominently featuring religious themes and sites within Nepal, 
Also, cultural personalities and politicians, fauna and flora, and yes, of course, the beautiful landscapes and mountains of Nepal. So let's talk about it a bit more, Mount Everest, because there is a really cool postal element to it. As Nepal began loosening its policies on isolation in the 1950s, it was first opening its doors to mountain expeditions. And so New Zealander Edmund Hillary, along with Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, became the first climbers confirmed to have reached the summit of Mount Everest in 1953. Edmund Hillary was part of a British expedition to reach the summit. Expeditions up Everest had been going on before, primarily on the north side of the mountain in Tibet. This is prior to China restricting the West's access to Everest in 1950. So Nepal became a central focus, but expeditions up mountains had to send mail. Primarily to keep people up to date, such as your family or the sponsors of the expedition or the media. But you would also use the mail to send souvenirs. Souvenirs were a great way to fund the expedition and they were done ahead of time. People would send money before the expedition and in return you would later send them some mail from the base camp. Souvenir hand stamps and cancels and Cinderella stamps were created as part of these expeditions and they make for an interesting postal history topic to explore and collect. Now, if you want to take a really good look at expedition mail of the Himalayas and Everest, you've got to check out this presentation that is on the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library's YouTube channel. It's totally worth the watch, and I'll put that link in the video description. Now, yes, I do have some expedition mail uh, from the Himalayas, specifically from Mount Nupsi. So, before I show you this, let me just show you a stamp to help explain where Mount Nupsi is. Everest is part of a massif that consists of three peaks. There is the famous and tallest Everest mountain, and then also Lhotse and Nupsi or Nupsa. Lhotse is actually listed as the fourth tallest mountain in the world, and Nupsi would be the 21st tallest mountain if it was considered a separate mountain. I believe it doesn't count because it is part of Lhotse. So these three peaks are right beside each other. And also, just by the way, look how awesome this stamp is. A set of three displaying the three peaks. Each stamp has its own peak. So here's Everest, Lhotse, and Nupsi. And it was issued in 1982. Perhaps my favorite of Nepal's mountain stamps. I always thought that a stamp featuring the Himalayas or Mount Everest would make for an epic extreme philately photo. You know, if you climbed one of the mountains and then snapped a picture of a stamp surrounded by the snow-capped peaks of the Himalayas. It would be just brilliant. I mean, I tried with Laura, uh, but we weren't, we weren't too successful. Anyway, while the summit of Everest was reached in 1953, Lhotse's peak was reached three years later in 1956, and Nupsi was only reached in 1961. Apparently, it is particularly challenging to climbers. This postcard is a souvenir from that 1961 expedition that was the first successful expedition to reach the summit. So let's explore it together. On the picture side is a black and white image of a snow-capped Nupsi with clouds dusting the top of the peak. In the background I believe that mountain is Lhotse and cut off on the left here would be Everest. This picture would have been taken on a previous expedition. On the other side of the card we can see the description of the photograph. Nupsi, 25,850 feet from the Nupsi Himalayan Expedition 1961 and the photographer Alfred Gregory who was actually the photographer for the Hillary Tenzing Expedition in 1953, the first expedition to successfully reach the top of Everest. So this picture is from that famous expedition. It was sent to Stephen Braham of Middlesex, England and has five stamps used for postage all featuring mountains. These two were issued in 1959. These ones featuring Mount Machaputre were issued in 1960, along with this one featuring Everest, part of the same set with King Mahendra's portrait. 
The postmarks were a bit difficult to read, but they were received at the Kathmandu General Post Office on what I think was the 26th of April 1961. I had to look at images of other postcards to get a better guess on April, but it makes sense because I believe this postcard was prepared by the climbers in early April, before they succeeded in reaching the top on May 16th. In one of the climbers accounts of the expedition, they mentioned that they spent a whole day in early April signing 900 expedition postcards. So now I also know how many were actually made. These postcards were signed at the Nupsi base camp thanks to a hand stamp that I have two of on this card, Noopsy Base Camp, and the climbers themselves each signed the card, notably Dennis Davis who reached the summit first on May 16th with Sherpa Tashi, also Joe Walmsley who led the expedition. I think that these two signatures are from the primary Sherpas, but I cannot tell, and this fingerprint is interesting. I found a site listing one of these expedition postcards and claims that it is from a Sherpa, but I found an article from that time that claims that it is from a postal runner. These cards would have been picked up from the Nupsi base camp in early April and carried to the post office, reaching there on the 26th of April. The signed postal runner for this expedition was apparently the same postal runner for Edmund Hillary's expedition. And postal runners were an important part of the mission. Mail was not only important to the expedition because it allowed climbers to communicate with the rest of the world, but it has been noted and documented that mail was an important morale booster for the base camp. Receiving mail from friends and family in many ways kept the climbers going through those harsh conditions weeks and months at a time. So I kind of hope that this is the fingerprint of the postal runner, an important member of the climbing team captured on this historical artifact. Another stamp has taught me about a place that I knew very little of. I learned about Nepal's history, its philately, its mountains, and mountain expedition mail, which has been really interesting. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit that like button and subscribe. And comment below. Let me know if you collect stamps from Nepal and what you found interesting about this episode. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.